I should love fishing. <laughs> I should love fishing. I have been surrounded, it seems, my whole life. You know, I grew up um, going to my grandfather's house, my favorite grandfather. I just loved this guy. I idolized him. And he was an avid fisherman. And I loved everything about him except the fishing part. I tried, I tried to love the fishing part. I would go fishing with him in Ohio, in Columbus, and I would go fish with him in Florida when he moved down there. And, and I tried to just, I just, I, I, don't, I just thought it was boring. I'm sorry. Those of you who are fishermen, you're angry with me right now. I just, it's boring to me. I want more action. But I tried. I tried to fall in love with fishing, but I just spent time with Grandpa. Then when I was 10, we moved to Michigan and what is like a fisherman's paradise. This is, this is where I, I moved when I was 10. My parents still live there. There is the X that marks the spot. I mean, right between two great lakes, not like the, the Great Lakes, but there's lakes all over Michigan and there's like, you can't see it on the map here, but there's a canal that connects these two lakes. And, you know, I went canoeing and boating all the time because I love the water and I tried fishing. People would come over to our house and go, oh, you are so lucky. You live in the perfect place for fishing. And I'd be like, right. I just, I, I, didn't, I didn't get into it. So then I left home, went to college, met this beautiful woman, married her and found out that she is the daughter of like the the most avid, biggest fisherman in the history of the world. This guy is Mr. Outdoors Man. He fished in oceans and lakes and ponds and creeks and trout streams. He, he tied his own flies, for those of you who are fly fishermen. People would order their flies from him. And, you know, I went fishing with him. We went surf fishing in the Atlantic Ocean. And he, you know, everybody else is like throwing it out there, you know, 50 feet. And then here comes Big Sam. First of all, his, his pole is like 20 feet long. He's a big man. He's like, whoo, whoo, whoo. And then that thing went all the way across the ocean. And he just, and I thought that was kind of cool, but then nothing. And I'm like, here we go again. This is why fishing is so boring. Eventually he caught some things, but I'm just like, I, I'm surfing, you know, swimming, boating, but just standing there just didn't work for me. So you know, and I, I went to, a couple years later, we went to seminary and I made friends with a guy who became one of my best friends. He's an avid fisherman. And I never went fishing with him. He was like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, he's like, Jesus loved fishing. You know, if you are a follower of Jesus, you should love fishing. I'm like, I know, I know, I, I love Jesus, but I don't love fishing. And so then we move here to, you know, Elyria. And a couple years after we move here, a guy realized that I loved water. I'm always trying to be on the water. So he gives me his old boat. And he goes, now you need to go fishing. I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> Do you want your boat back? And he's like, well, no, why would you? I mean, you don't fish. I'm like, no. And when people find out I have a boat, they're like, dude, you, how awesome. You live near Lake Erie. You can go fishing anytime. I go, yeah, but how often do you go? I, I've, never, I've never gone fishing on Lake Erie. And people look at me like I'm a bad person. You have a boat, but you don't go fish. I know, I don't like fishing. Are we, are we clear about that? <laughs> and so that's why I'm always kind of like, oh, Jesus, why did you have to use this metaphor? I'll make you fishers of men, you know, this whole thing about fishing. And um, I'd, hear, I'd hear sermons from pastors who were fishermen, and they would wax eloquent about how many parallels there are to fishing and reaching people. And I wanted to stand up and scream and go, no, <laughs> it's not, that passage is not about fishing. And I said that to somebody, and they're like, hey, whoa, whoa, chill out. Just because you don't like fishing doesn't give you the right to reinterpret the scripture. I'm like, oh, I'm not. That, that, that passage is not about fishing. So turn with me to that passage, Matthew chapter 4, and I'll show you. <laughs> not that it's not just about fishing, but what it is about. Matthew chapter 4, this is the same passage we looked at last week, um, but I, I want you to open it up again and stand to your feet, and I want to show you some things that are so cool from this passage. It, it is the passage. The same thing happens in Mark chapter 1 and Luke 5. We, we, you know, we looked at that last week. It's the call to ministry. It's a powerful passage. And I, for those of you who are new, I'm not standing because I broke my leg. I'm not trying to be a prima donna, although people try to think that I am. Here I am on my throne. Um, but I just got a broken leg. So uh, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake for they were <coughs> 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 fishermen. <coughs> 
I'm sorry, I'm just making that up. They were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus. You know what? Let, let's not read it like that. Let's read it to take advantage of our graphics, guys. Here, let's try this again. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Okay, you, you may be seated. You say, well, <laughs> how, how can you say this is not about fishing? I mean, look at this phrase. Follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. Now, so th this is one of the reasons why we, we really need to read multiple translations when we're studying the Bible. Because Sometimes uh, translators get all excited about an idea and they're trying to make it relevant and they end up um, actually um, obscuring the meaning. And this is, I think, a prime example. See this word fish here? It's a verb to go out and fish for people. That's actually not in the text. Um, there is no verb to fish for people in this passage. Neither is this language, I will send you out to fish for people. It, the, this word fish here is the, the same word for fishermen. Up there, don't, don't miss this. This is, this is actually important. We, the way this should be translated is, I will, um, I will make you fishermen for people. So there's no, there's no verb about fishing. He's not talking about fishing. This passage is not about fishing. Some people just walked in. They're like, whoa, whoa. Chill out, dude. I, I, I will. Uh, but it'll take me a while. Um, what is it about? First thing Jesus says, follow me. I, I, I want to use the, the old King James, the ESV, the NASB. They translate this very literally. Follow me and I will make you fishermen. I will make you fishermen of men. I will make you fishers of people. And trust me, as we walk through this, it's not about fishing. It's about following. So when, when Jesus says, follow me, that is what this passage is about. And these preachers that make it all about fishing, well, let me show you the parallels. No, Jesus is not talking about parallels or fishing. He's talking about following. And that's what this passage is about. So write down in your notes, follow me. We're going to actually take the phrases, the literal words of Jesus, and we're going to look at these one phrase at a time. And it's going to open up to you what Jesus meant when he says, follow me. This idea of following Jesus, being his disciple, is, is the core of his message. Remember, this is the start of his ministry. At the end of his ministry, three years later, he's died. He's been raised from the dead. He's about ready to ascend to the Father. Wouldn't that have been incredible to see? Jesus just floats up to heaven. Hello. Just before he does, he gives his disciples the last command. Go make disciples. So here's the beginning of the ministry. Follow me. Be my disciple. The end, it's kind of like bookends. Now you go make disciples. So something's happening when, we, when we're following Jesus where he's actually teaching us not only to follow him but to make disciples. So let's talk about what this word follow means. Um, the, the word has... There's three different Greek words that gets translated follow. This first one is the one that's in your text today. It literally means to, to come behind. That, that's, that's all it means, is to come behind somebody else. The implication is that you're, you're coming behind them because you're following them. That makes sense, that, right? That's not hard to understand. Uh, but I stay behind. <laughs> and do you guys remember that one time where, where Peter said to Jesus, oh no, you're not going to go do that. You're not going to die on the cross. And Peter said, get, what, what, what did he say? Get behind me. That's the same word that Jesus uses here when he says, follow me. You're like, what? Because Peter is trying to get ahead of Jesus. And Jesus goes, no, dude, you're, I'm the leader. You're the follower. So remember how this thing started back in Matthew 4? You know, get behind me to follow me. He's not being mean when he says get behind me. He's just saying, I want you to follow me, so start by getting right behind me. This next word, to follow after, akalutheo, it's the most popular word in the, Greek, in the Greek language for following. And it means to follow someone literally. You know, they start walking that way. I literally start following. It also refers to kind of a following someone's way of life. 
you know, I'm, I'm following the philosophy they have or following some thoughts they have. So it gets used both of those ways. Then the last word for follow is the word imitate. And that makes sense. I'm, I'm watching somebody do something and I follow them by doing the same thing. Now that last word is the word, the Greek word that Paul uses when he says in 1 Corinthians, you know, the old King James has, be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ, or newer translations, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as, these are actually pretty bold words. How many of you would feel confident saying, follow me as I follow Christ? That's, that's pretty, that's woo. But that's what Paul says to the people of Corinth. Now, this is actually a, a very helpful verse for us because when Jesus said, follow me, he's there in the flesh. And as he starts walking that way, it's pretty simple. Get up or stand up, you know, and start literally following Jesus. But when Paul writes to the people in Corinth, the city of Corinth, I don't know if you know this, he was in Ephesus. That's the other side of the Aegean Sea. So how are the people in Corinth supposed to follow a guy they can't even see? Paul's living in Ephesus. You know, he's across the, the water. And I, I love this because this is what you and I have to figure out. We can't see Jesus anymore. What's it? I mean, we know what it was like for the disciples to follow Jesus. They, they saw him. They watched him. He went there. They followed. But how do you and I follow a Jesus we can't see? I, this is why I like this because Paul was the first person who kind of figured out what does it look like to follow a Jesus you can't see? All the disciples, they followed him in the flesh. They knew what it was like. And we owe a great debt to Paul. And, and this is, by the way, why I'm leading a discipleship trip to Greece. You've heard us talk about this. To, to, and, and some people have asked me, well, where are you going? So let me just take the opportunity. There's our itinerary. Well, well, we'll start in Philippi, which is where Acts 16 starts, where Paul starts his missionary journeys. And we're going we're gonna to literally follow the exact same path. It's called the Ignatian Way. We're going to follow the exact same path that Paul took, following his footsteps. But more importantly, we're going to stop at each one of these cities and, and open up the book of Acts and open up 1 Corinthians and Romans and, and Philippians. And we're going to listen to the teaching of Paul where it was given. Isn't that crazy? And we're going to not just follow the footsteps of Paul, but we're going to follow the teaching, the way of Paul, as he taught us how to follow Jesus. Because he was the first guy that figured out how to follow Jesus when you can't see him. So there's the itinerary. Um, go down from just through the book of Acts. Then the Corinth. Here's Corinth. Uh, take the, take a, a boat across the water. That's going to be awesome. To Ephesus. And then go back to Athens. And then some people will leave the tour and fly back to America. Others will then jump a plane and go with us to Rome. <laughs> Woo! And see what Paul did in Rome. So there, there's the trip. If you've been wondering about it, there's the itinerary. Uh, t this Saturday is the last meeting. If you want to go... Um, we've made some changes. You should check it out. Made it a little bit cheaper. Um, and so this is your last chance. This Saturday, this is not in your bulletin. So if you want to go, write it down right now. This Saturday, 9 o'clock here at the Elyria campus. Um, this Saturday, what time? Exactly, 9 o'clock. We'll talk about this as a discipleship trip. It's going to be amazing. So back to our question. How do the people in Corinth follow a man who's living in Ephesus and writes them this letter from Ephesus. This is going to help us. And the, the best way I can show you is the way the NIV translates this verse. Instead of it being, follow me as I follow Christ, they say, follow my example. Oh, so I, I don't follow the footsteps. I don't have to see you, Paul, to follow you. I'm following your example. And, and this is really the one of the most important parts of what Jesus meant when he said, follow me. Remember the night before he died, Jesus said in John 15, I set you guys an example. Do anybody remember what, what this was after? He had just washed the disciples' feet, remember? And he says, now follow me. What he, 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 he doesn't mean every time you see somebody, stop, ask them to stop and say, hey, can I wash your feet? He's, he's not meaning to follow like that. He means follow my example, you know, serve people. Um, when there's a serving opportunity, you go first. Follow, follow my example. Do what I did. Be like me, Jesus is saying. And so the disciples literally did follow in his footsteps, but they also, as they followed, they picked up the way of Jesus. How did they do this? 
what we talked about this last week, they watched him. They listened to him teach as they followed. This is what we do. So I challenged you last week to start reading the Gospels and, and watch what Jesus does as you're reading. Did any of you take me up on this challenge? 2019, start reading the, the New Testament. Start reading the devotions that we send out every week. And, and as you do, watch Jesus. Watch where he goes. Because he goes places other people don't go. Like, you know, people are saying, don't go to Lorraine. God sends us to Lorraine. <laughs> Why? Because we want to be like Jesus. He goes places where nobody else goes. Everybody else wants to get out of that town. No, Jesus is sending us there. When a, when a leper would come, everybody would be like, ah, you know, stay away. Jesus would say, come here. Or he would lay his hands. Let's watch the way Jesus treated people. Let's listen to what he said. Listen to how he spoke to people, how he spoke to the outcast, how he, what he taught. Let's learn because as we watch and listen and learn, then he's going to say, now I want, you to lay, I want you to lay hands on people. Did you know that you can do this as a disciple of Jesus? Lay hands on people and pray for their healing? That's what Jesus did. He wants us to, he wants us to listen to people's hurts. He wants us to listen to the Holy Spirit. And he wants us to lay hands on people and pray for them. Just because, just because, that's what Jesus did. So we obey him. We, he sends us out to do ministry. But remember when we said last week, because this, this, this stuff is mostly reviewed from last week, this line. Last week I said in order for us to obey him, we're going to have to trust him. And we're going to have to surrender. Now, this is where it gets hard. Let's just be honest. A lot of people like to talk about following Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. He's a great guy. But when it actually comes to doing what Jesus did, when it actually comes to, f to following his example, we're like, well, you know, I don't, what if he goes to a place I don't want to go? What if, he, what if he leads in a place I don't want to go? So we follow from a distance, or we follow kind of half-heartedly. Jesus, as long as you're doing what I want you to do, as long as you're going where I want you, I'm good, I'm good. But the moment you call me to go someplace I don't want to go, the moment you tell me to do something I don't want to do, the moment you say give or love or for, forgive, he, yeah, I'm out, I'm out. I'm, I, I still want to be in charge of my life. We need to surrender the leadership of our life if we're going to really follow Jesus. I, I, I'm glad a few of you are saying amen. This, this is where the rubber meets the road. Let me just ask you, are, are you following Jesus from a distance? Just kind of making sure he's doing what you want him to do before you go? Or, or have you sold out to Jesus? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but in all our campuses, let me just ask you, have you sold out? Are you following no matter what? Because that's what he's asking from you. Surrender your leadership. Well, why is it so hard to surrender our leadership? You know, I mean, I like being in charge of my life. So do you. I mean, that's what we do. Um, but why is it hard when we hear Jesus say, follow me, surrender the leadership of your life? Well, one of the things that Jesus said in Matthew and Luke, I'll, I'll quote from Matthew, was one day he said to his disciples, to his disciples, if any of you want to follow me, be my father, you must give up your own way. The, if you've got the NIV or one of the older translations, it says you must deny yourself. I bet you've heard of that. If anyone wants to be my disciple or wants to be my follower, you must deny yourself. Have you always wondered what does it mean to deny myself? This is another good example of why we want multiple translations. The NLT, the New Living Translation, does a phenomenal job of translating that phrase, deny yourself. It doesn't mean that you need to hurt yourself, cut yourself, you know, deny yourself every nice thing. That's, that's not what he means. He means deny that self-will inside all of us. I have it. Can I see the hands of everybody who has self-will? Come on, everybody put your hand up. Come on. We all do. And I've got to give up, surrender, getting my own way. That's hard. That's what it means to surrender leadership. That's surrendering this default self-centeredness that I have and that you have, that every human being has, I'm looking out for myself. I mean, I have to, because who else is? I, 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 uh, I want to be in charge of my life. It's my life. 
Don't, t- don't tell me how to live my life. I-, I-, I agree if you're talking to me. I have no right to tell you how to live your life. But there is one who does. You have been made by Jesus. You are made in the image of God. You belong to him. But not only are you made in the image of God, you belong to him. Jesus went to the cross and died for your sins. He made you. That's good enough. Then he died for you. And he's perfect. And he knows what's best for you. And he will never lead you astray. Dude, that person's worth following. Anybody who lays down their life for me, I'll follow that person. See, don't just follow anybody. But Jesus, he's worth following. Don't you think? Should we follow him? Yes. Lay down your life for him because he laid down his life for you. Follow him. But, but let's just get real clear. Think about it. Don't, do this. don't make some emotional decision. Pastor's up here spitting and shouting. Yeah, let's follow Jesus. Think about it. Are you willing to follow him to the end? Because another reason we don't want to follow him is because uh, I don't know that if I agree with the same outcomes that he has. You got to surrender those. What, what, I mean, what if he sends me someplace I don't want to go? I know, I know, I know. My plan for my life was to be a basketball coach. I had it all figured out. I was, what a life, man. Spend my life in shorts and sneakers with a whistle in my mouth playing basketball and teaching kids how to play basketball. To me, ultimate dream. And then Jesus goes, oh, by the way, um, that your, your life doesn't belong to you. I like basketball too, but I don't want you to coach basketball players. I want you to coach people. I'm calling you in the ministry. Oh, what? Remember I told you this, this story before. I, I, I never had a good example of what a pastor was. So I was like, that's the worst thing you could ever cause me to do. Call me to be a stinking pastor? What? But I love what God's done with my life. But I, I didn't know he was going to do all that. I didn't know I was going to meet you all. I didn't know I was going to be able to be a pastor of church, the open door. What, a, what an amazing opportunity. But I surrendered the outcomes. And see, you don't know what God has planned for you. And he's not going to tell you. He wants you to trust him. Will you surrender the outcome? Because if you're not, then you're really not surrendering. You're just saying, I'll follow you as long as you go where I want, do what I want, take me to the places I want to go. See, if we're going to understand what it means to follow, then we need to understand what it means to surrender everything. The disciples did. They left their boats. They left their nets. They left their parents. They left everything. And I love how we saw last week in Luke chapter 5, uh, Jesus had did, um, did this miracle. Remember, so, you know, push your, push your um, boat out and, and throw your nets out in the deep. But we'd done this all night, and then we didn't caught anything. They caught this massive catch of fish, two boats almost sinking, the biggest catch they'd ever had. And Jesus goes, okay, leave that behind. You remember that? <laughs> you know, you're going to make a ton of money with that, those, that catch, but leave it all behind. And they did. They, they left everything. Is that what Jesus is calling you to do? To leave your job? Huh. I, 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 yeah, I guess. Actually, probably not. He may, but probably not. Why wouldn't Jesus call you to leave your job? He, here's why. Because God's plan now is that you are in full-time ministry. I meant to use that phrase. (laughs) You're in full-time ministry wherever you are. And so he needs your presence to shine the light of Christ at your job. Because I'm not going there, a pastor. He needs you to go there and show him what does it look like to be a salesman who loves Jesus. What does it look like to be a teacher who loves Jesus, who's following Jesus? What does it mean to be a construction worker who loves Jesus? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus where your job is, where you live, at the gym, wherever you hang out? We need light, remember, in the world. And so he sends you to your job as a sold out follower of Jesus. You're in full-time ministry as a follower of Jesus. So that, you know, he may, like he did with me, call you to leave your job and your dream, but probably, probably not for most of us. Instead, he wants us to shine that light where he, where, wherever our job is, wherever our home is, wherever our school is. We're going to have to surrender whatever he might ask us to do. I heard a guy say one time, I love this. It's like, it's like uh, giving somebody a piece of paper, blank piece of paper, and then signing your name at the bottom and saying, okay, now, now that I sign my name, I will do whatever you say. It's like the old Simon Says game on steroids. You know, I I sign an empty sheet of paper 
and my name is signed there. I'll do whatever you say. Now, you fill in the page. <laughs> what? I'm not about to do that to anybody. But I will for, Je- I will for Jesus because I, I love Jesus. And he, and he loves me and he loves you. I'll sell out for him. You know, guys, let me just be, be um, let me just say this to you. Those, some, there are some of you who are so excited about following Jesus. The last couple of months, you've gotten so jacked about this. You're, you know, you're not crazy. You're not crazy when you sell out to Jesus. What's crazy is when a person sits in church and knows the truth and knows who Jesus is and yet holds back and goes, I don't know. He made you. He died for you. He says, follow me. And you go, nah, I'll do my own thing. That's crazy. Now, people who are not in church, they don't know any better. But you do. Those of you who are coming to church week after week or once a month or whatever, but you're not following Jesus. You haven't sold out. What are you doing? (laughs) Follow Jesus with everything you've got. That's not crazy. That's that's smart because you're following the wisest, most loving, most perfect leader in history. That, I, that makes sense to me. So that's, that's, that's what I want to call you to do. So now, what's going to happen as I follow him? Well, this is the cool part. Next phrase in the verse, I will make you. This is why I don't like the NIV because it says I will send you out to, be, to fish for people. No, it misses a very very important word. I will make you. What does that mean? Let's write it down. Let's talk about that. Um, when Jesus uses this word, it's the word poeo, by the way, which is where we get our word poem from, because a, a poem has been created by a poet. This word poeo refers to, to making something, uh, to forming something, to shaping something, to f- creating, fashioning. It could be making something with a, with a thread and needle. It could be making something with your hands, like making something out of wood, making something out of clay, making something out of stone. It could be making food. It could be making, um, uh, uh, making a song, making a poem. It's, it, whatever you're creating, shaping, forming, fashioning, creating, you're doing, making something, that's what it is. Jesus says, I'm going to make something out of your life. Here, write this word down. I'm going to shape you um, lovingly and wisely because I know what I'm doing. You, you, you don't know what's best for you, but I do. And so watch this. As you follow him, that's the key phrase because this passage is not about fishing. It's about following. As you follow him, he will make, he will shape, he will form your life into a life that will blow your mind. You, you can't even imagine the things that God wants to do through you. Peter and James and John couldn't. If, if, if Jesus had said to them, dude, in just a couple of year, years, you're actually going to heal somebody. You're going to lay your hands on somebody. You're going to pray for them, and you're going to see them healed. You're going to see somebody raised from the dead. What? what? Jesus didn't say any of that stuff because he knew it would freak them out. He just followed follow me. And there's things that Jesus wants to do in your future that he hasn't told you about yet because he's afraid of freaking you out. And he wants to know, will you follow him? Will you let him shape your life? <laughs> but, but this is what's so cool about discipleship is that the loving Jesus, the one who has my very best in mind, but more importantly, his very best in mind, but it's, you know, he's made me for a purpose. And if I'll follow him, he'll shape me for that. Um, this, is, this is what we mean by spiritual formation. Maybe you've heard that phrase. Some people say, well, it's not in the Bible. Yeah, it is. I will shape you. Jesus himself, I will make you. I will form you for a purpose that's beyond your wildest imagination. (laughs) When I, I I wrote about this in my book. Um, When I was in the first grade or young, I can't remember how young I was, uh, Mrs. Hastings, our art teacher, gave us an art project one day and it's a bunch of clay. And she said, now make something out of this clay. Shape it, form it, be an artist. And, um, I, I did. Wait till you hear what I did. Uh, years, years later, I'm getting ready to leave home, and I'm, my mom and I are in the attic going through all my stuff and throw this away. Let's, I want to take that. Can you put that in storage? And we came across this blue blob. <laughs> that's the only way I can describe it. I don't have a picture because I threw it away a long time ago. I mean, I'm like, what is this? She goes, oh, that's your art project when you were in the first grade. And I'm like, what is it? It's, 
ugliest. You know, I had painted it blue because that's my favorite color, but the blue had chipped off, and so it's blue and white. And I mean, it's, it's the bizarrest, ugliest thing you've ever seen. And so I said to my mom, well, what was I trying to make? She goes, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, this is, why did we keep this? She goes, because you wanted it. I'm like, let's throw it away. You know, while other people are making pencils out of the clay and giraffes, you know, and, and computers out of the clay in first grade, I apparently took the clay, balled it all up, and then squeezed it until it got hard and then took my fingers out and that was my project. My project. I know, you should laugh, that's stupid. But that's the kind of artist I was in the first grade. Now, if my last name was Picasso, you'd be going, whoa, dude, even in the first grade, he was a genius. Do you see that clay? I mean, look at the texture. Oh, do you see the message that I see? But I'm just Jim Minling, so it's stupid. It's, it's just a blob of clay. But when Jesus shapes your life, he's the master artist. He's the master artisan. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus says, or Paul says that we are his Christ's workmanship. It's the same Greek word, same Greek root word. We're his poem. We're his masterpiece. We're this art project or this master thing he's building with great love and detail. And he's awesome at it. You're his project. You're his art job. You're his construction. And he's awesome at it. You're his masterpiece. Isn't that a cool thought? And he's shaping and forming you. For what? Well, f- for a life that is beyond your imagination for a life of ministry, for a life of being used by Jesus to see incredible things happen. Over the years, I've used this acronym that I found somewhere. Um, and you, most of you probably have heard it by now. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a cool acronym. It means, it talks about how God shapes us. We are shaped by our spiritual gifts. And that's what happens when you become a Christian. When you become born again, the Holy Spirit fills you and gives you spiritual gifts. Those have to be developed but that's part of God shaping you, giving you those spiritual gifts. It's so cool. My, one of my gifts is teaching, preaching. I, I couldn't do this stuff <laughs> until I became a Christian. H stands for what you have a heart for. That, that means what I'm passionate about. You know, I'm passionate about racing cars. I'm, I'm passionate about building things with my hands. I'm passionate about uh, landscaping. You know, you know, whatever it is that you get jacked about that just gets you real excited. You have a heart for that. Makes your heart race. God gave you most of those, many of those desires. A stands for your abilities. This is different than spiritual gifts. This is like natural ability. So whether you're a Christian or not, this happens when you become a Christian. Abilities just given, are given to everybody. It's natural abilities. You're fast. You're an athlete. You're, um, you're great with numbers. You're an artist. You know, we all have natural abilities, but God doesn't want us to waste those for the kingdom of God. Um, P stands for your personality. Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Do you like things that are structured or do you like things that are fly by the seat of your pants? Do you make decisions with all kinds of data or do you make decisions with intuition? You know, all these are personality differences. God gave you your personality. You don't want to be like anybody else because he made you to be like Jesus, but you still get to, to be yourself with the unique personality he made. Then E stands for experiences in life. This is one of the things that God does most to shape us. What kind of home did you grow up in? Um, was it a broken home? How did that shape you? Did you um, have a lot of siblings or were you the only child? That shaped you. Did your parents get divorced? That shaped you. Did, did, did your parents get remarried? That shaped you. Um, what was your dad like? That shaped you. What was your mom like? What was the teachers like? What was it like to live in your neighborhood? What was it like to live in your town? Um, that all shaped you. Did you go to college? Did you finish college? That shaped you. What job did you take? How, what, how many jobs have you worked at? What's, what's your life? All these things. So you're not just living a life when you're a Christian. You're being shaped. When you're following Jesus, he's shaping you and using, isn't this cool? He's using all these things to master, to, craftsmen, to craft, craft a beautiful um, masterpiece that he is proud of and he delights in. Such a cool thing. This is what he's doing. As, as, you tell me, as we, oh, I need to preach this more. As we follow, this doesn't happen automatically. I know a ton of people who've had a ton of painful experiences, but they've never learned a thing from any of them. Just going through life doesn't shape you. Well, it does, but it's not how Jesus shapes you. So some person can go through life and just be a bitter, angry, vindictive person. Another person went through the same life 
and they're broken in the right places and they're tender and they love people and they're compassionate and they care and, and they're, they're amazing because they let Jesus shape them as they went through life. So it's as we follow he does these things and he's teaching us, training us. This is what, this is what he's going to do with the disciples. They don't know this yet. They're, he, they're just following. But as they've Follow, they watch and they listen, and Jesus is teaching. They're like, whoa, that's interesting. And then he, he moves from teaching to start training them. He's developing their life. They don't even know it. But this is what he's doing. Why? Because he's using all this stuff to transform their lives. Sometimes people think that, that all this stuff happens when you come down to an altar, altar or you, you raise your hand. You know, all this stuff happens at once. No, it starts there, but then it's a series of steps as you as you follow him, he does these things. And what an adventure it is. Now, what's he shaping in all, during all this? What's he, what's, he, what's he leading towards? What's, he, what's the goal? What's the purpose? Last phrase. We finally get to it. I will make you fishers of men. Or as some translations, you know, fishers of people. I like that better. So what, what, why did Jesus say this? It's going to be real profound what I'm about to say. Don't miss it. Why did Jesus say, I'll make you fishers of men? Because they're fishermen, and that's what they understood. That's it. Don't look for parallels with fishing and and, following Jesus. Don't look for parallels in hooking somebody or capturing somebody in a net. That's not what Jesus is doing. You know, forget the fishing. It's not about fishing. It's about following. And the reason why Jesus uses this language is because this language they get, they're fishermen. Duh. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's going on. If they were a bunch of farmers, he would have said, follow me and I will make you farm for people. If they were carpenters, he would have said, follow me and I will make you builders of people. If they were blacksmiths, I'll make you shapers of people. If they were doctors, I'll make you healers of people. If they were thieves, I will make you thieves. Oh, forget that last one. Okay, no. So that's, that's not right. But what he's saying is, I want you to leave everything you know and you're working for me now. Leave it all behind. Jesus never mentions fishing for men again. Why? Because it's not about fishing. <laughs> but he did say over and over again, follow me. If you follow me, you're going to deny yourself, take up your cross. If you follow me, you're going to have to lay down your life. Follow me, follow me, follow me. He says it again and again and again. And that transformation that happens as they follow him is a change in focus. They focused on fish. They focused on water, the temperature, the wind, the, the, the environment. They focused on all that stuff in order to be the best fishermen they could. Now he said, I want you to change. You don't even think about fishing anymore. Now you're thinking about what? What do you think? People. That's what he means by fishers for men, fishers for people. Your focus now is on people. For the rest of your life, guys, I want you to start loving people, think about people, reaching people. It's all about people. That's what, that's what I've come to do. I, I love people. I care about people. So you're going to have to be a change of focus, a change of purpose. It's not about making money anymore. It's not about how many boats can you get. It's not about how many fish can you get. It's, it's not about bragging. No, no. Our whole purpose has changed. Now, your purpose is my purpose. And what's my purpose? I came to seek and save the lost. That's what I want you guys to do. That's why I want you to watch me, listen to me, follow me. It's going to be a whole change of activity. Sorry, but we're not going to be on the water anymore. Well, maybe once or twice so I can walk. Uh, but but it's, no, it's not about all the stuff you know there. Now, you're going to follow me. You're going to do what I do. You're going to, you're going to be so focused on what I'm saying, what I'm doing, what I'm teaching, how I'm training you, how I'm apprenticing you, that it's, you're gonna be, you're gonna, it's gonna be a change of your whole life. You're going to become like me. Oh, that's what this is about. No, it's not about fishing. It's about following Jesus. And since he fishes for people, builds people, shapes people, you know, since he's about people and helping them and, and saving them and building their lives and healing them and helping them become disciples, that's what, that's what you're going to do. You're going to be just like me. See, see, this only happens as I follow. None of this stuff happens if I just 
like come to church once in a while or um, say nice things or try to be good. No, this only happens when you sell out to Jesus and follow him. But when you do, as you follow Jesus and as you watch him and listen and learn from him, you will become like Jesus, which is a crazy thought. It only happens as you follow. Would you, when, you, when you're done filling out those three blanks, would you all say this with me out loud? All of us. Well, yeah, all of us on all of our campuses. Would you all say it with me out loud? Here we go. As I follow Jesus and learn from Jesus, I will become like Jesus. Wow. And that's the three points we've been making. Follow me as I follow Jesus. I will make you. It's not automatic. When he's shaping us, we've got to listen. We've got to watch. We've got to learn. If I was preaching in Appalachia right now, I might say, you know, as I follow, uh, uh, fo Jesus might say, follow me and I'll learn you to, to become like me. You know, that's because that's, that's the language. But we have to learn what he's shaping. We got to cooperate. You got to cooperate with Jesus. It's not, it's not magic. But as you do, you're going to learn from him. You're going to find yourself becoming more and more like Jesus. And when you're like, when you're like Jesus, amazing things happen. So let's go back to where I was earlier when I talked about what's required of us. Surrender. Jesus won't surrender for you. And you can't follow him if you don't surrender. I'm not saying he won't let you. I'm just saying you, it's impossible. Are you ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and follow him? You're like, well, I've already done that. Cool. Some people haven't. So let me talk to those of you who have never surrendered your life to Jesus and invite you to do that right now. Right? I mean, literally, right where you're sitting, just in your own heart, you can just say, yes, I want to follow you. And now, now I, get, I have a pretty good idea what it means. I need to leave behind my own thing. That's, that's, that's called repentance. I, I'm, I'm sorry for wasting my life living it for me. I repent of that. I surrender to you, Jesus. I'm going to follow you. Would you. Is that you? I hope it is. And, and don't make this hard. It's just, yes, I will, I will follow. I surrender. I'm going to give you a chance to do that in a couple seconds. Um, you can do it right now. I surrender. Okay, what about those of you who have, have surrendered in the past? You've started to follow Jesus, but you've fallen by the wayside. You've stopped following. You got more focused on your own thing. You're, you took up your own leadership again. What do you do? You just surrender again. <laughs> you know how we talk about here loving God, loving people, and living surrender? It's a lifestyle. Guys, I practice this as a lifestyle because I, I find myself sinning from time to time, and I'm like, ah, I know better. Jesus, please forgive me. I don't, don't want to live like this. I repent. I surrender. Let's go. <laughs> That's all I have to do. I don't have to give money. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to, you know, say something special. It just, you know, you know I don't want to like, I don't want to live like this. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I receive his, I breathe in his grace, and I move on. I live surrendered. Unless you're perfect, <laughs> then you're going to have to learn how to live surrendered. But that's how disciples live. We're constantly surrendering. Constantly surrendering. We're living surrendered. So if you've kind of taken back the reins, taken back the leadership, then this, you're, what you need to do is just say, I surrender again. Maybe, you know, maybe um, you went to uh, work and thought that was my place to do my own thing. And you didn't realize that work was a, a ministry place. By the way, you should go to our work as worship conference. And one of our own guys, John Beckett, is also going to speak at that. I'm so excited about that. You can learn how, how do I live for Jesus at my work. Maybe you've just realized, maybe you didn't realize that work is a place to shine the glory of God. Okay, you didn't realize, but now you do. So live for the glory of God. Maybe you thought that, that the church would raise your children and you just took them to Sunday school. No, your job is to raise your children for Jesus. Okay, you screwed up. Now start over. You know, surrender. It doesn't really matter what you've done. This is what's so great about grace. It doesn't matter. Whatever you've done, however you screwed up, how bad you've sinned, it doesn't matter. Because when you surrender, everything starts new. Is that great or what? Everything starts new. 
Every day is a chance to start over and live surrendered. Don't live in the past. Jesus doesn't care what you've done wrong. What matters is what he's done on the cross and what he wants to do in you as you follow him and he shapes you. Okay, I'm done. It's your turn now. Let's, close, let's all close our eyes. How many of you would say right now, whether it's the first time or whether it's the 10,000th time, I want to follow Jesus. And so, I surrender. How many in each one of our campuses, how many would there be? I surrender all. Here I am. <laughs> Down on my knees again. I'm surrendering all. Here I am. I'm doing it, Lord. In all of our campuses, would we all stand to our feet? And our worship leaders and our campus pastors are going to come and lead us. I don't know, maybe you want to just like get out of your seat and walk down to the front and surrender. I don't know, it's up to you. That'd be a good thing to do, though. Just, I surrender. I'm going to show my surrender. I'm going I'm to start following. I'm going to follow again. I'm going to live surrendered. As we sing, you just, you just, you just come. <laughs> and you surrender it all. Look at us, Lord. Here we are. So many of us wanting to follow you. So, will we? There's the question. And I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.